Nuba, what a joy, what an honor it is to be here with you, to really think big right now for the new economy catalyst, to take us to the next what if question, because uh, incredible where we've come already in terms of the 40 years where we first sort of started to see biotech companies looking at genetic engineering techniques. And now we've got the mRNA being able to, well, that messenger able to tackle COVID, but you now think could, could go on to tackle cancer as well. Where now in terms of the progress that you've made already? Well, first, uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, indeed, actually, I, I entered this field as a graduate student in, in 38 years ago. And uh, so there were a handful of companies who were barely genetic and barely engineering, but actually had the great hopes of being able to make a new category of drugs. Uh, in their case, it was based on proteins. And uh, rolled the clock forward on the 40 years, and we're now talking about the patient, the subject making their own drugs inside their body for whatever purpose, based on giving the body a code, just like software, and instructing the body to make a drug of interest or a vaccine of interest. And that journey really has has, has taken shape in the last decade, but it was based on a lot of work done ahead of time. First, there was 20, 30 years of experience in the protein way of doing it, which is, which is much more complex, much more costly and slow, but nevertheless, proved that you could actually have proteins work in the body as drugs. And then with the advent of DNA, genomic sequences, we understood the, the DNA code for things. And eventually we've used that code in the form of messenger RNA, and that's the part that Moderna pioneered starting 10 years ago, in order to now be able to properly design, formulate, administer, and deliver an effective message to the cells inside our bodies to be able to make a vaccine of interest, in this case for COVID. A vaccine of interest for COVID, what is of interest for you? What, what barriers do you want to now break? What, what key illness that you feel just plights the world? Could you feel that this could be really useful? Well, interestingly, um, if you go back a year and a half before COVID uh, showed its uh, a perilous face, if I can say that, um, yeah. We had already tried this technology on nine different uh, infective, infectious diseases and successfully raised antibodies in humans against all of them. These were things like Zika or CMV, a very, very dangerous virus for which we have no vaccine that's approved, or any number, RSV, any number of known uh, diseases. So that, that work already proceeded, and we felt pretty comfortable that on the 10th one, we could at least get the body to make antibodies. On the other hand, we've also had in parallel years of work we've done in cancer, in autoimmunity, in cardiovascular disease, in each case taking one or two uh, lead programs into human trials, and that's where they are today. So one thing is for sure that now with the evidence provided by the COVID-19 vaccine, we feel, I can't say we feel more optimistic because we were pretty optimistic and more bold because you know, the company has had a long history of being bold, but we feel that we have the resources and the relationships that would make this go faster so that indeed we will apply this to cancer. But let me not forget to mention, we will apply this even more in an accelerated fashion for infectious disease, things like influenza, things like HIV, where you know, as a society, we've either accepted in HIV that there cannot be a vaccine, I don't believe that's true, or that in influenza, there cannot be a good vaccine. So that the seasonal vaccine we take works 40, 50% of the time, and we consider that protection. Well, we just saw that we could do a lot better. And that doesn't, there's no guarantee, but the technology suggests that's possible. And maybe I'll just end by saying, I think the moment is really a moment for us to think about biotechnology in a more uh, expectant way, in a more demanding way. I think this is a, an industry that has grown up largely in obscurity where most things never worked. It was really complex, filled with jargon. And so, you know, when a drug came out of it once every decade, people would feel like, wow, that's a major breakthrough. It doesn't have to be that way. And our hope, our expectation is what changes is that people expect much of what biotechnology does to work. And if it doesn't work, we learn and we improve. Not that it's some kind of a lottery where it's supposed to work once in a while, but mostly not. That would be the internet moment, if you will, for biotechnology, the same as how internet made software industry come out of obscurity and become a consumer-facing 
technology sector, I think that's the moment that may be awaiting us. What sort of time frame? How quickly can we have this internet moment? Can I be really demanding of what you guys are producing? I would like the urgency of the moment and the demandingness of the moment not to subside, even as this pandemic hopefully gets further and further uh, uh, defeated. And the reason is that, that it is those conditions that allowed us to do, many folks, to do mm. what was done. And, and I worry that if regulators, if the collaborative networks that exist between the government and the private sector, if private companies absolutely go back to doing what they're doing, then there's no reason to believe that it won't now take five more years than needed to do a vaccine. It will work half as well. And basically, we'll, we'll struggle to find a way to, to, to even get the resources to do that type of development. I, I hope that that is not what we go back to. That's a new normal that I don't wish to return to. Talk to us, therefore, about what's in place, the barriers that have been broken, the relationships you formed as a private sector into the public sector. We know that you as a private company, Flagship Pioneering, has been building up the resources that you say are now there. You've raised a new three billion in excess of dollar fund. But what about, what now can government put in place? And I'm not just talking about the US government, I'm talking internationally here. How, how do we ensure that you can go on to defeat cancer, influenza, some of the other key HIV that we were just mentioning? with this joined up approach that we currently now benefit from within the dire straits of a pandemic? So it could just be that we all agree to keep the intensity going. I'm a little worried that mm. if we keep our old mindsets, but then kind of hope for intensity, it's not gonna last very long. But I think there is a shift in mindset that's also possibly upon us. And it could be a question as to whether governments and various other institutions and, and parties uh, uh, embrace it or not. And that is the area we call health security. The rough uh, idea is the following. If you look at healthcare, one thing we've learned over the last year and a half, and we've known it all along as well, is that what we really mean is sick care, because we only actually avail ourselves of it when we get sick. And so this, a system that basically only works when there's disease seems to be only half of the solution, maybe less than half, if we compare it to our physical security. Imagine if the only way we ensured our physical security as a society was nuclear bombs and, and, and fighter planes and, and aircraft carriers, billion dollar expenditures for, for these kinds of overwhelming force. Unfortunately, our defense department concerns itself with intelligence, with surveillance, with, with terrorism, with ideological uh, 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 combat long before there's a big war. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with our health? I would invite us to think about why we're resigned to the notion that we are well until we get sick. And when we get sick, it's probably going to get worse and we're going to die. And in the meantime, we get some treatments. I've spent the last 38 years developing new treatments, new diagnostics. And as an innovator, it's always been hurtful to me that we can't actually work upstream of disease. So health security would be the mindset that says, why don't we ensure that disease is as far delayed or or deflected as possible. And when we have disease, then by all means, some of the expensive treatments can be used sparingly. But I suspect that that is a different paradigm where the cost of healthcare and the appropriateness of the tools being used for what the problem is can be very, very different over time. And that, I mean this globally. So you might say, well, that sounds like a fantasy. Uh, it, it doesn't need to be because the last year, year and a half, Actually, we started treating a threat as a matter of health security. We didn't call it that. We're now beginning to increasingly view it. So I foresee a moment where we look at this and say, you know what? We've been misdefining where medicine is needed. Medicine is needed upstream of disease, what we call kind of a pre-disease state. And by the way, that's not just for infectious disease. That's for cardiovascular disease, mm. cancer. If we can identify pre-disease states, if we can intervene, not treat, intervene with these pre-disease states and delay the advent of the patient journey that we hear about, then I think we have a very different mindset. And frankly, something good will have come out of the pandemic because the pandemic will have allowed society to actually have these tough discussions and say, why is it mm. that we only care about our health when we lose it? But Nubar, at what level do we need those discussions? Does this need to be a groundswell? A, uh, the people on the street, the people who have been affected by this 
pandemic to say, I demand more. I, because at the moment, people are left up to exercise, eat well, drink well. Is it a lack of education that stops that? Because, or, or do we need help? Do we need government to say, we need to demand more of this? We need to now frame it not as sick care, but as preventative care. I think we need it all. I think we need it all. We need the groundswell. We need people to accept less uh, or be less accepting of the status quo. And I think coming out of this trauma, I hope that people will rethink just how vulnerable they found themselves. I think that governments should be re re realizing that they need to alter the social contract with those who are being governed such that they are uh, uh, offering forms of security of health, not just dealing with the after effects of losing it. I Do think, think this is will, to do with that. I think the conversations yeah. you're having with government at the moment means they are looking to change that social contract. I think there's movements to that direction. I think during the G7, these were topics that were brought up. Uh, I know in the UK, in Europe, there are countries that have uh, adopted new efforts to create new types of approaches to health. Very, very recently, I've spoken to several country leaders uh, in the recent past about the need for this type of thinking. But it's not only up to them because they are uh, they they govern and they have institutions. Those institutions tend to be conservative by definition because that kind of is at least preservative. And and you don't want to gamble with people's health and you don't want to bring forward solutions that are not yet ready. On the other hand, unless there's a path forward, innovators and investors will not work on coming up with these solutions that might then indeed create a need for a different regulatory framework. So I think this is going to be a, a broader discussion. And by the way, the media uh, has a big role to play in this because in the last year and a half, the media has disproportionately talked about disease, spike, PCR, all these words that I think were relatively foreign. Uh, and now... I, I hope they don't give that up. I hope that they keep the interest and say, why aren't we doing some of these things in other areas? Because that that is what it's going to take for us to say, okay, what's the alternative? We've been fixated on you know insurance and how healthcare is provided and who's mm -hmm. paying for it. But actually, I think we've completely missed the boat on saying, why don't we take all this advanced technology and science, identify the, 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 the prior few steps before we declare something a disease, act then, defend, deflect, and then uh, uh, go off to the disease state. It's going to take different education, by the way. The whole medical mm -hmm. establishment has to think about what its role is, because right now we train doctors to deal with disease. We don't, tell do we don't train doctors to deal with this interface. By the way, health isn't the absence of disease. Health is the absence of pre-disease. And, and that's the mm -hmm. part that we miss. We think we go from healthy, 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 diagnosis, sick. Well, it, the biology doesn't work that way, just because humans view it that way. There's a huge period in between that I think we can do something about. And we're just here it is 2021 and we're beginning to try to do that. Do we need to change the incentives, therefore? Certainly many feel the incentive in, incentives in the U.S. healthcare are out of whack. But then it's not exactly working beautifully where it's government funded, for example, over in the U.K., where, which I know well. What, is there anywhere that you think there's a blueprint or the start of a blueprint to really get to where you need to see us go? Well, I don't know that there's a, well, certainly the UK uh, with a national health system has the beginnings of being able to potentially measure the consequences of experiments in this direction. So that's already, and I'd say the preconditions are correct in the UK, maybe some Scandinavian countries and even Canada, where there is a national health system that should care and if there are new offerings, new approaches, there's at least a way to, to, to track and have the information. Because in the U.S., very, very hard to find out. By the way, the reason in the U.S., you know, insurance and generally people don't pay for any of this is because people change insurance systems on average every three years. So the effect of dealing with a pre-disease is a benefit to your competitor. I mean, this is, I've been told this for years and years. And so that's something that's got to change. Now, uh, unfortunately for society, but fortunately for this ideology, I would say that the higher healthcare costs continue to get, the less effective our healthcare system, the more we're going to be forced into considering these things. And so I hope the pandemic is a wake up, but I think our pocketbooks are going to be a permanent wake up because we just cannot afford waiting for disease to deal with it permanently. It's got to change. It's got to change, Nuba. Leave us with one 
really exciting vision that you have. You've painted how this can, what you've worked on, what you've helped develop, what you've funded can help tackle from HIV to cancer next. But what about the flagship the pioneering that you have? What, where do you want to see your resources go right now to make real change that blows our minds? Well, flagship pioneering, uh, just to say in a very, very nutshell, is in the business of trying to foresee new platforms that could create a whole slew of new products affecting human health and the planet's health sustainability. And in that regard, we're working on many, many different things, each of which, if they came to fruition, would be quite, quite stunning. Uh, but I'll say as a, maybe a, a category I would look forward to is the role machine learning and artificial intelligence are playing in a dozen of our different projects and the type of leaps that that's going to enable us to make. More so than in other industries, uh, AI machine learning allows us to deal with biological questions with the immense complexity inherent in them because these are systems that evolve. These are not man-made systems and therefore have a logic to them. They don't have a logic to them, or at least if there was one, it's invisible to us. And these machine learning approaches have allowed us to be able to identify the changes that happen with disease, with treatment, with various genetic backgrounds in cells, in our bodies, in ways that we had no conception of before. And it's what's very exciting is that what results from that. And I think we'll be able to say more, know more, and do more about human physiology uh, in the next year than we've been able to think about in the next 40 because of these new insights that are coming around. So I'm very excited by that, but equally there are many other things that we're very excited about.